Well, this evening, uh, we're actually going to be returning to John's Gospel, chapter 3, and I'd like to begin by reading a, a portion of what we were looking at this morning. But again, we're going to focus on just that one verse in verse 27 that speaks to us about God's sovereignty. Uh, we read in John 3, beginning in verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and the people were coming and were being baptized. For John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. The Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening, and may he also apply it to our hearts and our lives. Uh, John said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. And he said this, of course, in answer to the disciples' question regarding Jesus and his ministry. Should they be threatened by what Jesus was doing? Or should John, for that matter, uh, be threatened over the fact that Jesus was more successful? That he was baptizing and discipling more people than he? Well, no. And why not? Well, because... Jesus would not be able to do what he was doing unless it had been given him from heaven. That is, unless it had been God's will. Now, sometimes uh, we may be tempted to think, especially as we look at all the things going on around us and we look at all the evil that is present in this world, that somehow God is not in control. The things that are happening are outside of his plan, outside of his will, that something has gone wrong. And that he's not going to be able to deliver on his promises. That somehow things aren't going to come out all right as the Lord says that they will. But that isn't the case. God is very much in control of all things. As a matter of fact, everything that happens in this world, everything, is a part of his plan. Uh, even everything that happens to you. And of course, the grand example of that is what we see in the table. Sometimes you might look at what happened to Jesus Christ, how his people turned against him and how the Roman Empire, basically the Roman governor turned against him and crucified him as a great crime, which it was, something perhaps outside of God's control, something that wasn't his will, but you know that God actually determined that through that crime he would bring about the salvation of his people. This was God's will, even this most evil act that has ever taken place in history. God sent his son into the world to die in that way at that time in order that he might save us from our sins. Now this evening I want us just to think about two things. I want us to consider that God is absolutely sovereign and that sovereignty extends not only in what he commands us to do but also in what he actually brings about or allows to happen in this world and secondly, that, that what that means, of course, is what is happening in this world, even what's happening in your life, is a part of God's sovereign plan. Nothing happens by accident. So let's first of all consider that God is absolutely sovereign in everything. And we can really put it another way, that, and we'll, we'll divide it up into these two, two ideas. God has a plan. And God is working that plan out for his glory. Now, first of all, God has a plan. And we call this plan, of course, the will of God, what he wants to take place, what he's willing will actually happen and what not. Now, you're probably aware by now, and this is going to be your theology lesson, by the way, because we want to look at the principles and then we want to apply those principles. There are two senses in which the Bible says that God has a will. The first is what he commands. We call that his preceptive will. God has certain precepts that he wants us to follow. It's his will that we do this. And the second is what God is actually willing would take place 
in this world, whether men would obey or disobey his, his, uh, his commands. We call that the decree of God. Now, his commands, of course, are the things that he tells us in his word that he wants us to do. And sometimes uh, we even misunderstand that. Sometimes we think, well, you know, the, the things that, that God commands or he wants us to do are only those things that he tells us straightforward. You know, you will do this, you will not do that. But we need to recognize it also includes things that are not quite so straightforward, things that he commands us perhaps indirectly. Now, his straightforward commands are easy enough to understand. They're summarized for us in the Ten Commandments. This is what I want you to do. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what is God's will for my life? Lord, show me what your will is. Well, that is his will, that you obey him, that you obey these commandments. This is where you need to start. If you don't start here, God's not going to show you anything more about what he wants you to do in life. But we do need to recognize that there are other things that God commands beside the Ten Commandments, but he does it in a less direct way. Let me give you an example. The scripture says the Ten Commandments, as a matter of fact, tell us that we are to observe the fourth commandment on the first day of, well, actually, on, uh, well, not on, well, on the first day of the week. Let's just say God tells us that we are to observe the fourth commandment on the first day of the week. Now, we know from the Ten Commandments that we are to keep the seventh day holy to the Lord. But the question might come up, the seventh day from what? The commandment doesn't actually tell us plainly. So God has to show us in another way. He shows us in a less direct way. He doesn't just simply point to that first day of the week and say, do it. But he shows us rather by way of, of well, other ways, less direct and uh, perhaps even by way of example. For instance, the author to the Hebrews tells us that the fourth commandment continues, that it hasn't passed away, that that commandment or the observance of it is based now on the finished work of the new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is his restoring the creation through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus not only came into the world to save a people, he actually came into the world to reverse the effects of the fall on the creation itself. So this day of rest is based on the work of the new creation rather than the finished work of the old, which, is, which was destroyed, I should say, through the fall of Adam. The author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, so there remains a Sabbath rest. This is the keeping of the fourth commandment for the people of God. Why? For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. This is talking about the work of Jesus Christ, who after he had died on the cross and had been put into the tomb on the third day, rose again from the dead and entered into his rest. The work of the new creation was then complete. That, the author to the Hebrews tells us, is the basis upon which the Sabbath rest remains. Now we see in the Psalms that that day of his resurrection, the day in which he entered into his rest, would be in the future a day of rejoicing for the people of God. The psalmist writes in Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24, the stone which the builders rejected, that is Jesus, has become the chief cornerstone. That's happened through his resurrection, Peter tells us in the New Testament. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This day in which Jesus finishing the work of the new creation, entering into his rest was predicted would be the day in which the new covenant people of God who lived during that time and after would actually meet together and rejoice and worship before the Lord. And that is exactly what we see the early church doing under the guidance of the apostles. Luke tells us in Acts 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week, which is the day Jesus rose from the dead, when we were gathered together to break bread or to worship the Lord and observe the Lord's table, as we're going to be doing in a few moments, Paul began talking to them, which means he was basically preaching to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. You need to be thankful that I'm not as long-winded as Paul. But notice they met together on the first day of the week to break the bread 
to hear the word of God expounded. This was the day of Jesus' resurrection, the first day of the week. This is the day he wants us to meet and to worship together. This is the day he wants us to keep the fourth commandment. Now, the day that the church is to meet for worship, I want you to notice, isn't up for grabs. It's not a day that that we can choose, as it were, willy-nilly. God has given to us a specific day so that we would all be able to gather together to worship the risen Lord together on the day in which he rose and to encourage one another to follow him. The author to the Hebrews in another place in chapter 10 verses 23 through 25 says this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So again, my point is this. God gives to us certain direct commandments, but he also commands certain things indirectly. And again, this is by way of inference. We understand that he wants us to observe the fourth commandment on the first day of the week. So again, getting back to asking the question, do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, if you do, begin with what he shows you in the scripture, both directly and indirectly as to what he wants you to do. That's why he redeemed you. Remember, not doing what he wants you to do is sin. He's redeemed you from sin so that you might walk in the ways of his commandments because that is the right way, that is the way of love. But as I mentioned, there's another sense in which God has a will, and that is what he is willing will actually take place in this world. Now, we're also referring to this when we ask the question, what is God's will for my life? You know, aside from the question of what I should do, what specific road does the Lord want me to take? Well, that has to do with what we call his plan or his will of decree. The Bible tells us that God does have a plan, a plan that includes everything, absolutely everything, that will take place in the world, that has taken place, is taking place, will take place, and that that plan is unchangeable. Paul tells us that this all-inclusive plan that he has in Ephesians, well, he he talks us, or he tells us about it in Ephesians 1.11. He says, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, notice, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, not just some things, but all things according to the counsel of his will. That's his plan, what it is God has determined he's going to do. That plan is not something that God sort of uh, changes as he goes along, as he sort of sees what's unfolding and then he, you know, he reacts, as it were, to the things he sees. No, no, he knows everything in advance what's going to happen. This plan is something he enacts and it's something that is absolutely unchangeable. The author of the Hebrews, again, in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 18, tells us as much. And you'll need to pay attention to this. I had to back up a little bit to get the context here. He says this, For when God made the promise to Abraham... Since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, notice, the unchangeableness of of his purpose interpose with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to to take hold of the hope set before us. God has a purpose and that purpose cannot change. God made this promise to Abraham on the basis of what he had purposed to do And he even swore by himself, since there was no one greater, to show Abraham that what he said could not fail to take place because God doesn't change in what he wills to do. 
Now, even if the Lord hadn't told us these things clearly in Scripture, we'd still would be able to figure them out from the fact that God knows all things, that he is absolutely sovereign, and that he has unlimited power. You see, the fact that God knows all things means that nothing can really take him by surprise. God, God's knowledge is infinite. God's knowledge is unlimited. This is what we call his omniscience. I mean, God not only knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances, you know, such as, again, the example where David, when he was in the city of Keilah and Saul, he heard Saul was coming after him and he prays to God. He says, God, if I stay here, you know, will the people of Keilah give me over to Saul? And he says, yes, if you stay here, they, they will. And so then David leaves and that never actually happens. But God knew that it would happen if he stayed. Jesus said on one occasion that if the works that he had done in Chorazin and Bethsaida would have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. Now those works weren't done there, but if they had been done there, they would have repented, and he knew that. Also, of course, when Paul was on his way to Rome and there was the storm and the shipwreck at sea, the Lord said, unless everybody stays in the boat, no one is going to be saved. If there had been people who had left, they would have perished. But if he stayed they would survive. Again, God knows what would have happened under any given set of circumstances. But again, in his infinite knowledge, he also knows what actually will take place in this world. And the reason why he knows is because what happens is what he intends. What happens is what he willed would happen from all eternity. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's, how things are going to work out. He knows how he's going to respond to these things and he knew these things even in eternity. He sees everything that could possibly happen under any given set of circumstances. And knowing this, he knows what he will and will not do in those circumstances. In other words, we might say God's already made all the decisions he's ever going to make. And they've all been made in eternity. Or more accurately, we want to say this. God didn't really sit down and decide what he was going to do. God actually eternally purposed to do certain things or not do certain things. It wasn't a decision. It was the eternal you know, thing he knew he was going to do because of his infinite knowledge. What he actually allows and does in history is what he has eternally purposed to do. And of course, he has the power also to do this. This is God's decree, his plan. The Westminster Confession of Faith, I should say the Westminster Assembly, put it this way in, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, verse 1. And I want you to notice that when we say that, okay, God has planned everything that's going to take place, that raises a few questions like, all right, what about all the evil that takes place? What about all the sin? Did God make that happen? Well, he planned it, but he didn't make it happen. Uh, he didn't force anybody to do anything contrary to their will. But let's, let's see what the Westminster Confession of Faith says. God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, yet so is thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away but rather established. Now, I know the temptation would be to try to deal with everything this passage says, but I don't want to get into that. But let's just notice here again the idea that God sovereignly has ordained whatever comes to pass, but when it comes to sin, God did not author it. God does not force anybody to do anything against their will. Okay, everyone is free to choose what they want at all times, and yet as they choose what they want to do, they're still doing what God has willed. Again, knowing what they were going to do, God either planned to let them or not let them do that, and all of that comes together in this huge, as it were, network or, or net, we might say, or web of cause and effect. God starts it off, and he knows exactly what's going to happen. It's his plan. Now, God not only has a plan, but he is working that plan out. And, of course, we call that providence. God has a plan. God begins to execute that plan. He does it first by creating. That's his first act. 
But then he upholds everything that he made and he moves it along from moment to moment. As history unfolds, we get to see what God has planned. And of course, all that he has planned, he has done for his glory. Again, one passage from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 5, section 1. God, the great creator of all things, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. That's pretty concentrated stuff, isn't it? I mean, the Westminster Confession, there's a lot that is included there, but just notice God is in control. That's what it's saying, and he does all that he does for his own glory. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 1, verse 3, uh, he tells us that it's actually Jesus who is the one who upholds and governs and moves all things along according to God's plan. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power, which means not only that Jesus keeps everything in existence as the Son of God, but that he's the one who is moving history along according to the plan of God. That's what the words actually mean in the original language. As a matter of fact, sometimes God needed to teach, uh, especially those who were proud, such as Nebuchadnezzar, he needed to teach them this lesson. When Nebuchadnezzar, remember, was walking on the, uh, the wall of, of, the, of the, uh, the city that he had built, Great Babylon, he's boasting basically about how he did this all by himself. Didn't need God, didn't need anybody. Have I not built Great Babylon for my own glory and by the power of my might and so forth? And it was at that time God humbled him. He became, as it were, a wild beast for seven cycles, and we're not sure exactly how long those were. But when he came to his senses, he lifted his eyes to heaven, and he said this in Daniel 4.35, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? God is absolutely sovereign. So what is God's will? Well, first of all, it's his direct command, the Ten Commandments, the things that he wants us to do, that he tells us explicitly, and also the things that he commands us more indirectly. His will is his word, and he tells us what his will is in his word. But his will is also what he has ordained would actually happen. Out of, the, out of all the possible things that could happen, the things that actually do take place. And so we need to see that God claims absolute sovereignty in two areas. In our lives, morally, what he commands us to do, and also over the things that actually happen to us in this world, even whether we're going to keep those commandments or not keep them. Well, again, as I've said, that's your theology lesson uh, for this evening. Now let's get down to some application. And I, hopefully, hopefully these things will make a little more sense. Now getting back to the question, why wasn't John concerned about Jesus' ministry, that it was eclipsing his own? Well, there were several reasons, as we saw this morning. They had to do, of course, with who Jesus was, the Son of God. What it is he had come to do. He came to save his people from their sins. He came to gather his bride together. And it had to do with even what John was sent to do, to draw attention to Jesus. He was the forerunner, the one who was meant to point him out so that people would follow him. But all these things can really be wrapped up into God's will. John recognized this was God's plan. This, you know, no man could, could be doing the things that he's doing unless it had been given him from heaven. He knew this was God's plan. Now, as I've said... God's plan includes absolutely everything that takes place from the very beginning, even with the fall, to the very end. So from creation to the eternal state. And it includes everything, as I've said, both the good things that will happen. Remember James says in James 1.17, every good thing given 
and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow, and the bad things as well. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked, for the day of evil. So from the beginning to the end, the good things and the bad, the big things and the small things. History is unfolding exactly as God intends. Again, the things we want to see happening, the growth of his kingdom, uh, the fact that we're learning more and more about his word so that we might give him greater glory, the conversion of the souls that he intends to save, all of these things are unfolding exactly as he has planned. Even the bad things that take place, the things that we don't like to hear about, we need to recognize that they too are part of his will. The plagues, I mean, there's an Ebola outbreak in Africa. The famines, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the wars that are taking place. Uh, the things that we see happening in our nation right now that trouble us, the, the immorality, the greed, drug abuse, drunkenness, murder, social unrest, ethnic tensions, uh, the one that's perhaps foremost in our minds right now, the uh, advancement of the homosexual agenda to destroy marriage, and one that's been with us for quite some time, the murder of innocents through abortion. All of these things are happening to in the sovereign plan of God. Now we do need to recognize what we already saw in the Westminster Confession of Faith. God is not the author of sin. God did not create this evil. Okay? This is not something that he did. This is something that the creatures have actually done. These natural evils that, we've been, that I just told you about, the earthquakes, the famine, the plagues, and so forth, these are the results of the curse from the fall that took place on creation. When Adam chose to disobey God, it brought a curse not just on man, but also on the creation itself. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us that creation is going to be set free from that curse when the children of God are revealed, when Jesus comes again and he raises them from the dead. Uh, creation is groaning until that time, until it is set free from the corruption that it's under. But these things are the result of that corruption brought about from the choice of Adam to disobey God, and moral evil is the result of Lucifer's rebellion and man's fall. So evil, all this evil, all this, these things that we see going on, all the things that the unbeliever looks at and says, how can there be a God of love? Look at all the things that are taking place in this world. Well, the reason why those things are taking place is because of the evil of man. That curse has come about because of our rebellion against God. But God allows it, and God will use it, because God uses even bad things, even evil, for good purposes. Well, how is God going to use it? Well, he's going to use it in one of two ways. He's either going to glorify his grace in saving people out of these things, both the, the, you know, the natural evil and especially the moral evil, or he's going to glorify his justice in judging those who commit these evil acts. So everything is taking place is taking place for a purpose and that purpose is not always to make us warm and comfortable. Okay, well, sometimes we think the world was made for us and if things aren't going our way something's wrong. Well that's not the reason why God made what he made or planned what he planned. He did these things for his glory. He allows these things for his glory and when people are saved from these things they give God glory and when they're not saved from them and they face the consequences of those sins, God's justice is also glorified. God is revealing himself through these things. That is his plan. But we also need to remember his plan includes not just the big things that are going on in, in history, the history of the world or you know, on, on a national scale, but they also include the small things. They include, or his plan includes, even the personal details of your life. Now here's, here's again where I, you know, we need to kind of tune in and pay attention because I'm sure all of us at one time or another have been upset, discontent about either something about us personally, either the way we look or you know, the things we have or don't have or where God put us and so forth. Uh, we've all been discontent. But you need to understand that God has made you exactly the way that he wanted you to be made. 
David writes in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 14, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. God gave you everything that you have. He made you the way that was pleasing to him. He gave you the gender that you have. He gave you the build, the hair color, the eye color. He gave you the talents and abilities that you have, whether they're musical talents or athletic talents or intellectual abilities. He gave you your strengths and your weaknesses. He knew what spiritual gifts he was going to give you before you came to Christ. He knew those things and determined those things and purposed those things in eternity. You are exactly the way the Lord intends you to be. There's no mistake. Okay. He also knew what he intended to do with your life. David continues in Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Again, sometimes we complain about how the Lord made us and what he's given to us, but you need to realize that he made you for a specific purpose. Sometimes we complain about the families we were put into, but he puts you into the family that you're in. Uh, he raised you the way he wanted you to be raised. He called you out of darkness when he willed. He placed you in the circumstances that you have to face in life. He planned the good things that you would accomplish, even the sins that you would commit and how he would work all those things together for your good. Now you can complain about how he made you and what you've had to go through uh, and what you have and don't have, but you need to realize it's exactly what you needed. Not for your comfort, not because of your goals and your aspirations, but he gave you exactly what he wanted you to have so that you would do what he made you to do, so that you would be equipped to do exactly that. Even the sins that, that you and I have committed, he planned those too that he might work good out of those things, that he might turn us in a particular direction or work particular characteristics in us. Now again, we ask the question, well, if God planned even the sins I committed, does that mean that God is responsible for those sins and I'm not responsible for them? No, the Lord says you are responsible because those were your choices. Even God simply determined to allow you to have your way. Now, we've all made bad choices. But God has planned even to work those things together for our good. Paul writes in Romans 8.28, again, one of those passages that we love to think about, because it, it reminds us that no matter what happens to us, if we love the Lord, <clears throat> God intends it for good, and God's going to work it together for good. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Remembering at the same time that even though God has determined that he's going to work all the bad things we do together for our good, that we should never use that as an excuse to do bad things so that God can work them together for good. Romans 6, verses 1 through 2, Paul writes again, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? If you've died with Christ, as we saw this morning, you've been raised again to a new kind of life, you cannot continue to live as you did before. You can't use God's grace as an excuse for sin, as a reason to sin. Rather, you should use it as a reason not to sin. God continues to forgive you from the things that you do that would condemn you. How can you not love him and serve him more for this? Now in closing, let me just give us three things to take away from what we've seen this evening. First of all, that you should never complain about your circumstances. Okay, maybe God didn't make you the way you wanted to be. I know that was the case with myself growing up. Oh, I wish God had given me this. I wish he'd given me that, this ability and that. 
Maybe you don't have as much of the, of the world's goods as you wanted. Oh, I wish God had put me in a rich family and I didn't have to work. My future would be secure. I'd inherit a fortune. Maybe you don't have the greatest natural gifts or maybe spiritual gifts. Oh, I wish I'd have been a, an Edwards or a Whitfield and I wish I had the ability to do what these people are doing. You need to realize that maybe he didn't give you what you wanted, but he did give you what you needed. He gave you what he wanted you to have. And we also need to remember that he gave each one of us more than we deserve. That's one thing we always need to remember. We always complain about what we don't have, and yet, do you realize if, if God gave us what we deserve, then we would be suffering in hell right now if it weren't for his grace? How can we complain that we don't have everything we want? Well, instead of being unhappy because you don't have what you want, I think you need to learn to thank God for the things that he has given to you, the things you do have versus the things you don't have, and especially that God has chosen to give you eternal life. One of the things that's, that's been noted in, in church history that those who know and love the Lord have recognized from their own experience as well as from the word of God, the way to receive more from the Lord by way of blessing is to thank him for what he has given to you and not to complain about what he hasn't given you. We all have more than we deserve. Second thing, remember that he made you to give him glory. He made you the way that he did for a specific reason, a specific purpose. And whatever that reason is, he has given you what you need in order to do it. You don't need to feel like you're shorted because God has given you what he intended to give you to do the work he has intended you to do. So instead of complaining, again, that you don't have what you want, just realize that God has made you the way he has for a specific reason. Pray that God would show you what that reason is. Pray that he would give you the heart to pursue it and be content with that thing and then pursue it to the very best of your ability and seek to give him glory in it, um, asking for his help at every step of the way. And then that's, that's our individuals that were application, but let's also apply this to what's going on in the world. You know, don't be discouraged by what you see happening, either in the past or what's happening right now, because God has a reason for everything that's taking place. He has a reason behind allowing all this evil. And remember that no one is going to get away with anything in, in this life. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the thought of that, the realization that that just can't be the way things are have led some to, be, to, to even believe that God exists because all this evil cannot go unrequited. It has to be dealt with. There has to be justice. And some have believed in God for no other reason than that. Well, the fact is, the Bible tells us God does exist. He is a just God. And every single wrong thing that is done, every sin, every atrocity, is going to be justly dealt with by God. And as I mentioned before, God is either going to use this evil to glorify his grace by saving people out of that sin, or he's going to use it to glorify his justice by punishing them for those sins. By the way, I should mention the cross of Christ is the revelation of the justice of God. This is the reason why God can forgive us of our sins, because he poured out his just penalty for our sins upon Jesus Christ. The justice of God is seen in the table or in, I should say, in the, in the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all this evil exists to give God glory and we are one day going to see God glorified in it. Doesn't mean that we rejoice, of course, in what's taking place, but we can rejoice in the fact that God is going to work this together for his glory. So, as you see these things taking place, pray that God's will would be done. Now pray that his commandments would be kept. I, we do need to pray that even in light of all the evil that's going on. Pray that God will fulfill his will as he said that he would in his word, that he would work all these things together for good, that he would glorify his name. And again, we're going to pray a little bit differently based upon what we actually believe the Bible teaches about what God intends to do in, in this world versus what he's going to do in the future, which I think we can all agree on. 
But pray based upon what you see God saying here. Pray according to his will. Pray according to what you believe God intends to do about these things and with these things according to his word and at the same time continue to do what you can to turn the people that you know who are involved in these sins away from their sins to Christ so that when God finally reveals his glory in Christ on that day, they will be there to rejoice with you in what he has done, glorifying God for his mercy and for his grace. So let's learn from these things to trust God, to believe that what he says in his word is true. God is absolutely sovereign. He is sovereign on a global scale. He is sovereign on an individual scale. Everything is precisely as God intends. You can believe it. You can trust it. You can rest in his plan because if you love him, that plan is for your good. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to uh, apply his word as we need to hear it this evening.